thought I'd take this opportunity first to introduce myself and then hopefully I'll learn a little bit about you folks. So my name is Marilyn Ellis and my company is called Futures Found. Uh, one of the projects I run on this side is called Autism Job Club, just to give it a little plug. Uh, Futures Found, I meet with students and young adults and help them figure out direction for their future career or education. And Autism Job Club was born out of the need for extra transition support for young adults on the autism spectrum who are having problems transitioning from school to a job. And we meet a couple times a month at Robert Bateman. I have a table downstairs, so if you want to pop by afterwards and pick up information, I also have some business cards here uh, and bookmarks here if you want to get a copy of that afterwards. But what we're talking about today is too many choices. In career counseling, there's kind of this basic model that is very um, popularized by career counselors. People come to me with the question, what's next? And I help them to organize to answer that question. It's not that they can't answer it on their own. It's not that some people don't enjoy the journey. <laughs> And, and taking different routes to get there on their own. But some people do need a little help on getting there. Or sometimes it's the parents, I swear. It's not the kids. The kids would be just as happy to blithely go along, but, but the parents are going crazy. So the kids come to see me because of the parents. So the career general career pro counseling process is, number one, assess yourself. I use a couple of assessments for that. One called the myers Group type indicator, which probably most of you have heard of. And the other one is the strong interest inventory, and those two work really well together to give myself and the parents and the student a really good picture of themselves. Exploring options is step two of career counseling. That's where uh, the kids might be looking at universities, so they might be researching programs, that sort of thing. Testing possibilities, that's my funnest one. That's where they take on a volunteer job, or they interview somebody in a career they're interested in, and finally making a plan and acting. In grade 12, a lot of kids who uh, aren't planners jump right to this step, they just act. They just eeny, meeny, miny, mo, pick a, a university and away they go. So, um, oh, I did want to mention it. It's a tough act to follow what Mark Kielberger was, was talking about. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we are going from global, you know, back down to let's talk about our children, our um, concerns for their future. And I think the, the need for volunteer hours in high school is, is a great um, way to test possibilities of what you're interested in. And when the kids are, you know, that 12, 14 years old that uh, Craig Kielberger was when he, when he started uh, Free the Children, I, I think that's an amazing age where you awaken to a bigger world. But at the same time, at a certain point sometimes, you do have to come back in. I have two boys who are both in university. Um, and they have done no volunteer hours since starting engineering. Uh, they, they don't have time, and, and I know they'll come back to it, and some of their friends are, you know, have joined Engineers Without Borders, but they don't have the mental capacity at this age to, to do both. So, you know, don't be surprised if your, your child, you know, is, is or isn't interested in volunteering in high school, but also kind of goes away from it, and they will get back to it. Um, does anybody have any questions before I begin about this? What's next question, the career counseling process? No? Nope. Okay, so if you could raise your hand if you have a, a student in high school. Okay, anybody here who's still, a child is still in elementary school? Oh, both. Okay, I've got some people with both. Anybody with a child just in elementary school? Okay, great. What grade? Eight and five. Eight and five, okay. And eight is that transition to high school. I do actually work with uh, children in, um, in grade eight because some of them are trying to choose between different streams in high school, so it's, a, it's not a bad time. So, um, okay, too many choices. How many people here feel that the number of choices for their student are overwhelming after high school? Yeah. How many people think it was much simpler when they were leaving high school? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're not wrong, so you're not crazy. There, there are just way more choices nowadays. Um, did anybody ever read Barbara Colorosso's um, uh, Kids Are Worth It? 
or any of her other books. Okay, does anybody remember what she says about choice in her books? Does anybody? Because that's the part that really stuck out for me. She would give her young child, when they were getting ready for bed, she started really simple with choices. She would give them a choice of a blue pair of pajamas or a red pair of pajamas. And that's how simple choices can be when you're young. Nowadays, we kind of overwhelm our children with so many toys, so many activities, you know, so many choices. And sometimes we expect them to be the decision makers. But Barbara Colorado's attitude was that keep the choices simple when they're younger and you know, increase them as they get older. But I don't think she ever expected choices to increase, increase to the point that they are today. Um, one of her children, the, the funny thing that I remember was, um, she would offer her children this choice of two pajamas, and she had this one child who always picked a top from one outfit and yeah, the bottom from the other outfit. Yeah, so that's the little Barbara Colorado choices lesson. Um, did anybody ever read Generation X by Douglas Copeland? Okay, so some of you who, who did might be familiar with the term option paralysis. And does anybody want to give a stab at defining that or what that feels like, what option paralysis is? You can even make an educated guess. Yes? Well, they have anxiety about making any choice, so then they end up making no choice. No choice, yes. Option paralysis, when there's too many options and anxiety, results in no choice. And often you'll experience that with your teenagers. Um, and, and for parents, that can kind of drive you crazy, especially when they're not even looking at their choices. And then the final uh, choice lesson, lesson I want to mention, before I get into the tips that I promised you on, on making choices, um, the final one is, is there's actually an area of research. Um, and they actually call it choice overload. Has anybody ever heard of that term, choice overload? So choice overload is kind of, I heard on the news um, a number of years ago, once upon a time when you were getting a Bell phone, you had one company to choose from, Bell. You had three models to choose from, maybe it was even a dial, a, a rotary, or eventually it was the pulse. Remember you had to switch on your phone between uh, dial and pulse? Yeah, and, and these were your choices. And then I heard on the radio one day that then Bell's choices increased to like the hundreds. You know, you know how you probably have a thousand choices now dealing with Bell, especially since they're into satellite television and all that stuff. So you can see what's happened in our society is we've gone from this, you know, choice: am I going to use Tide or Sunlight? To these choices: am I going to use Tide or Sunlight or Seven Generation or you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you're not crazy. It's it has become that there's way more choices. And I want to illustrate um, what choice overload does to people uh, through an example of a specific study. So in this study, uh, they took consumers and they presented them with the choice of five different gourmet jams, okay? So these consumers would walk up to, to the table, or these they were subject participants, but they were acting as consumers, walked up to the table and they got to choose between these five gourmet jams as to which one was their favorite and which one they would purchase. So that was easy for them. Then they did a parallel group of people who had 50 choices of gourmet jams to choose from. Then they surveyed these people after they made their choices. And, and I want you guys to tell me how the people who were choosing between five choices of jam, how they felt after they made their choice of which jam they bought. And maybe they even bought two. Out of five? Yes. Right? Yep. Any other words come to mind? Confident that they made the right decision. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And by contrast, I've kind of, you've kind of already answered it, but how did the people who had the 50 choices of jam, sure, how did they feel? Mistake. <laughs> Did they even, were they even able to sample them all? They gave up. They gave up. Yeah, there, there's the option paralysis. Maybe they didn't even buy jam. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that color. Yeah, they pick based on their favorite color. Nothing to do with the taste of the jam. Perfect. Yeah, that's what some of them would have done. Um, so that sort of represents what your children are facing, looking at the options for college, university, and the workplace and careers. Um, there's this ad that the colleges run, and it says, 
5,000 programs, one of them's right for you. <laughs> every time I see that ad, I'm just like, are you kidding me, right? Like, so um, there is this very strong movement in our society, and this is not one of my tips. Um, there's a strong movement in our society to follow your passion, and then it will pay, right? Well, I did that when I left high school. I was a math and science brain, but I was also really good at home economics, drafting patterns and you know, designing things. Um, so I rejected engineering, and I went into fashion design. And I only lasted two years, because basically what I did was ruin a hobby. I was intrinsically motivated. I know. Follow your passion, ruin a hobby. That's what I see whenever I, whenever I see that expression. Um, I was intrinsically motivated to design clothes for myself, for prom, and uh, back then we called it form. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe for my friends a little bit, mostly for me. Um, and then you go to fashion design school and all of a sudden you're having to design for a stranger. You, you get assigned some model, random model who doesn't fit your dress and you know, it was just a totally different experience. And um, so I did come back to fashion design when my kids were in school. I got to do play costumes, Halloween costumes, <laughs> that type of thing. So I did rediscover my passion for fashion design, um, but I did not find it Particularly going to school for something creative is, is really, really difficult. And it can sometimes um, take what's unique about that creative person and kind of drive it into, into the ground is, is what I found. Um, sorry, I, I'm sounding bitter. <laughs> I, I don't mean to say that's the same for everybody. My, my husband's a graphic designer and uh, he was good at one thing. So um, he was going to either be an architect, didn't do physics, so he went into graphic design. So he's a commercial artist. Same thing sometimes. Sometimes he thinks that he would have been better off uh, keeping art as a hobby, uh, and he figures when he retires, he will paint and that sort of thing. But right now, he does make a very good living with, with following his uh, top skills. So I don't want to say that it can't be successful, because my husband's uh, living proof that it can be successful. Um, okay, so that leads us... Anybody have any questions about that whole choice thing or anything? Or And how about you tell me what you're expecting? Yeah. So... Yeah, I've got a grade 12 student who basically almost decided to take a gap year because he took too many choices. Yes, um, yeah. I'll make none. Yeah, option process. Basically, I have no idea why should I visit universities. I can't even figure out which ones I want to visit. Um, right. So that whole passion uh, thing, I guess that's, that really gets into the assess yourself, right? Because yes. if you kind of don't really know what you're strong at, you're not really liking a whole lot of anything. Like, they're really yeah. neutral. Yeah. Like, you end up with... Teenage boys especially. Yeah. Um, and then I had a daughter who thought she liked history. And, and does he even talk to you about this? Or do you oh, actually yeah, yeah, just yeah, extrapolate it from some no, of no, his no. body language? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he actually does okay. talk. Okay. One of those ones who actually tells you his, how his day does. went. Amazing. Amazing. Um, but the, the older child um, went off thinking she liked history, went off to try and study history. And again, same thing. Yeah, I don't like the way they teach it. Yeah. So I guess the question, my thing is more the assess and the explore. Right. How do you, how do you do so that? I'm gonna. That's where I'm gonna give you guys some tips today. I'm gonna give you some something to put in your back pocket and um, you know that you can do as your child's own career counselor. Right. I've given you the secret formula. Honestly, this is this is what's used. Some of you will need help outside the home, um, but the majority of you might not. The majority of you might be able to take these um, tips home. So. Um, and also, when they do the career exploration in grade 10, it's a little early for some of them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they don't take it in as much. And even when I see a client, uh, I had one come back with her sister this summer, and I saw her about a year and a half ago, and uh, she said it was six months before what she learned through the assessing herself with me really sunk in, and, and, and she like had an epiphany moment six months later where she's like, Oh yeah, I couldn't decide if I was this type or this type. I'm definitely this type, and, and you know, and she's come around and she's feeling very confident about her choices. And um, I should. This is a little side. side. Um, you know, our kids are generally different from us. And last year I did a presentation and I talked about that. I talked about how some people are planners and some people are not planners. And um, so when you have a planner parent and a non-planner child, that's particularly challenging. Um, <laughs> Except for the planner parents who can plan around it, but <laughs> there, there are some. There are some very good. Um, 
but and, and those are a lot of the parents I do see the, the planner parents the silent non planning planning child and um, uh, yeah so so you do have to be prepared for, for that type of thing because some of those non planning kids when backed in a corner into a corner like they're being backed into a corner in grade 12 they will just say none or they'll keep their options very open. Um, another little aside, my, my uh, youngest son, so, so my eldest son is in software engineering. He said, mom, I'm gonna pick one thing, he's a typical firstborn driven type child, I'm gonna pick one thing and stick to it, not like you, that's what he said, because I've, I've done many, many things in my, my uh, ongoing career. Um, my younger son, uh, I thought that he was being very focused too, which is surprising, because he's a non-planning type. Uh, he picked mechatronics engineering. He was on his first robotics team at Bateman. And uh, he was in a job interview um, last spring, and they said, wow, you're, you're not even 19 years old and you know what you're doing. And he said, are you kidding me? Because they were talking about their kids at home. They had, he had three people interviewing him, and they're like, my kid at home. And he's like, are you kidding me? I picked mechatronics engineering. Mechanical, electrical, computers, programming, like, I don't know. Like, I, that's why I think mechatronics, right? So, yeah, so, you know, he, I didn't realize the little bugger got around me with, with uh, his decision making here. I thought he was, he was focused. And um, he's not your typical engineer either, so he's, I've been told he's not going to get there in a typical way, and he is struggling in a, in a few courses and stuff. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Update next year. Um, <laughs> But, uh, okay, so back to tips. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah. When you talk about assess yourself, you mentioned that strong interest in mentor. Yes. Is that accessible? Like, would we be able to get that on the internet? So the, the two tools I use, the, the licensed versions of them are not accessible. Um, but there are similar unlicensed uh, type assessments. Now, what I like about the strong interest inventory is that it's been around for like almost 100 years, I think it's 70 or 80, um, and it has so much data. Um, Mark Kielberger was talking about statistics, and um, the, uh, the strong interest inventory has so much uh, data. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to hand out this handout now, which is on the, the strong interest inventory, so if you want to mind taking a copy and passing it along and share with your desk mate, um, I think we're going to run out. Uh, I did post it to the PIC conference website, that handout. Um, so the thing about the strong interest inventory is, is that it just does have a lot of numbers behind it and a lot of um, confirmation and validity kind of thing. Uh, same with the Myers-Briggs type indicator. The kids sometimes even do in grade 10, they do the Myers-Briggs uh, in their careers class, I know my son did, but you come up with four letters, you're assigned four letters for your personality. The, the assessment uh, report that I run for the Myers Great uh, actually gives you those four letters, but it also gives you all these shades of gray. So for example, I'm actually an introvert, but I'm an initiating expressive introvert. So I have a couple of extroverted traits, and that's something that you get from the report that I run. So it's much more comprehensive than one of the freebies that you can do online, but there's lots of Myers-Briggs ones that you can do online. But what I find with that is some of the people who've done it online or they did it in careers class, they didn't really get it. They didn't really understand the impact, and they may have typed themselves wrong too, because even the assessment I run is not considered 100% accurate and I have to actually go through and validate it with the person. And I send the person home like that girl that I mentioned who came back with her sister, um, when her sister came to see me and told me it was six months before she decided between two types that she was um, not sure which type she was. So, so yes, you can get assessments online, even my blueprint. Uh, all of your children pick their curriculum stuff through my blueprint. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so can you get back to strong interest in the Yes. If, like, are there other names and other tools, or are they the ones that we have access to, or they still call it the same thing? It's okay. I'm just wondering, can somebody share? We, we're missing one over here. Two. Two. Oh, two. two. Can two people share and pass one over this way? Great. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry you're going to have to repeat yourself. Do you need another one? I was distracted. Oh, about the strong story? Oh, just like oh, this. Um, thank you. Are there if we can't get this one because it's copyrighted, are there others under different names? Yes, or? if you go to my blueprint, yeah. um, there's lots of information. Um, now, 
not to plug uh, my services, but it'll sound like a plug for my services. Um, I uh, I like the strong. I, I got to choose between any when I when I was starting my business, which tools I wanted to use, and um, again, I chose the strong because of its its strong validity, its exceptional validity, and um, research and statistics behind it. And the Myers Briggs Type Indicator has some naysayers, but they don't really understand what they're looking at because. Uh, Carl Jung, who, who, um, who came up with that personality theory that the Myers-Briggs is based on, was just saying simply when, when there's a choice between extroverted behavior and introverted behavior, for example, that people have a natural preference for one or the other. Um, and he looked at three different pairs of preferences and said that there's a natural preference. He's not saying that you are 100% an extrovert. He's saying you have both sides, an extrovert and an introverted side. Um, so, so people misunderstand that uh, that tool when they when they're negative about it because again there's tons of research and there's now brain research going on saying that yes indeed some people are fast tracking in their brains to decisions and other people uh, maybe your son's one of them have the slow track to decision making maybe no track to decision making right especially um, before executive functioning and all that comes in in your, in your 20s right. So um, did that answer your question? So if you go to my blueprint, um, and there are some other tools, I think maybe even at the Pathways website. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of tools online, and they're a good place to start. Um, but just have the one caution that take whatever information you get um, with a grain of salt. Even my assessment reports that I hand out I caution them, you know, this is not telling you to be a bartender. Don't go home and tell your parents that the strong interest in inventory told you to be a bartender. <laughs> right? Um, because that, that one will come up for people who are social and, and, uh, and stuff. So, okay, any questions? Yes. So, um, for the strong interest uh, inventory software, yeah. is that North American data or is it international data that they Kind of I would have to check my books. Um, I'm pretty sure um, that the it, it's probably North American data, but they do have international versions of it. Uh, so uh, I could see if it's available normed for, for other information. For the reason sure. I ask is, you know, given the diversity that we yes. have now, yeah. par as parents we have we feel there are certain choices for our kids. Right. And the kids then when they come back from my blueprint and what else not, yeah. they have Something like we, you know, I want to be a bartender. Yeah. So. Yeah, I know it can be, it can be frustrating. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I have a daughter in grade twelve, mm -hmm. and uh, she finds students that clearly has too many choices. Yes. And uh, so she did a couple of those tests, but then the other day, which struck me a little bit hot, she said to me, "You know, I'm not really sure how valid this theory is because I think I answered the questions what I yes. thought they wanted yes. to hear, mm -hmm. maybe not, but you know, so you get the wrong picture. So yes. how do you see?" So the strong that? interest inventory, because it's a professionally designed psychometric test, it has checks in it. To try oh, and trick so them. Sure you so don't. it'll say, uh, "Do you like accounting system? Would you like to be an accountant? Do you like numbers?" you know, all these things, and, and, and it puts it all together. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on if nobody has a burning question, uh, and I'm going to actually talk about the, the strong interest inventory. That's why I did the handout. Um, so the first pair I want to talk about is actually um, the R and the E. That's the realistic doer. So realistic doers, they prefer physical or hands-on technical or applied outdoor or athletic pursuits. And uh, we often um, remember things better if we see them visually. So I brought you this little um, visual aid here. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to prop it up here. So, um, But this is the uh, example you can keep in your mind for, for a realistic type person. Oh, let me, let me back up a second. So the strong interest inventory makes the assumption that people have a preferred work environment. So where the personality test I was talking about makes the assumption that you have a, a, a preference uh, between certain traits like extroversion or introversion, the strong interest inventory, uh, the guy who invented it said, I think we can divide work environments into six different types of work environments. And those are the six you see in front of you. And it's called actually the Holland hexagon because he came up with this nice hexagon shape. And so we're going to go through them one at a time, and this is the tip that you can use. Remember, remember uh, Mark Kielberger downstairs was saying, 
uh, you know, look at what your kids are interested in. Parents, as, as, uh, as parents, you can help not only guide their interests, but you can also um, see what interest might make a good career, or, and this is where the, the tips that I'm trying to give you come in. Um, because, for example, uh, I have some clients who come to me and they say, oh, I want to be an airline pilot. And I say, oh, you want to be away from home, um, fly to all different cities. No, I'm a total homebody. Well, how about we look at something else for you then? You know, and it's that simple. Um, I had this other client, uh, he's hilarious. Um, very achieving type. He's, he's like a natural athlete, okay, in, where, where personality type goes. He's a natural athlete. He uh, came to see me because he was thinking of doing graduate work. It took him five years to get his four-year um, degree, and he told me he wanted to be a lawyer, or maybe a doctor, or he was one of those pilots, or something very prestigious, right? And, uh, you know, I, I don't ever tell people what to do, but I had him come around to the fact that, do you want to sit in law school for, is it four more years or whatever, and, uh, uh, you know, hit the books? And, because his favorite thing to do is to snowmobile across the frozen lake up at his cottage. Like, that was his discharge from school. So I'm happy to report, he's actually working in sales now. He's actually just been graduated to his own territory and uh, his own car, his own expense account stuff. And I see this kid going back for his MBA and running a co corporation one day. Like this is, this is the type of kid he, he is. And that's not to say he couldn't have gone the law route. He definitely could have. Um, it would have been arduous and a struggle and he would have done it and maybe he needed to do it. But no, it turns out he's very happy with doing what he's doing right now. Um, okay, so back to... Uh, this is the, the symbol I like to use for realistic, the construction hat. Computers, uh, which came out after the Holland Hexagon uh, came out, has been added to that, so that kind of goes opposite to the outdoor um, and hands-on pursuits sometimes. Uh, computers are a little more indoor, but still hands-on. Um, and then the, uh, oh, don't tell me I did that. What's opposite the um, realistic? Social, okay. I put my ass in the wrong spot. So the opposite, on your hexagon is social and we represent that through uh, this first aid kit here um, social is the helping the helping profession it says uh, people who prefer helping developing interpersonal pursuits and the reason why I want to highlight these two together is because um, Realistic people are like my father-in-law, he was a carpenter, or my nephew who is a auto mechanic. They like working with things, all right? Social people like working with people. So they're in the healthcare type professions, um, other helping type professions, and they, and they work uh, with people and helping people. Um, so the neat thing about the strong interest inventory is that it statistically shows that people who generally score high in realistic generally score low in social. Now not always, but generally. And I, I just was teaching to a group and I actually had them list me and I'm gonna ask you guys to give me, so I gave you one example of a realistic career, my carpenter father-in-law. Do you guys just wanna randomly shout out some, uh, some realistic careers that you can think of? Hands-on careers. IT guy. IT is a great one. Red it is. High T. Okay, we said carpenter. I'm just going to put trades. Trades. Maybe musician. Um, musician, I'm not going to put there because who said it was artsy? I'm going to put it under artistic. It is definitely hands on, um, but I'm going to put it under artistic. Okay, how about for social? Uh, I mentioned medical health care. Does anybody want to shout out? Sales. Or? Sales, I'm going to put sales under enterprising. We'll get to enterprising in a minute. Sales doesn't have to be helping. Who said sales? I do. Okay, um, the difference between sales, some salespeople are motivated to help, but some salespeople, I would say the majority of salespeople, are motivated to influence, right? So that would be the difference between social and enterprising, what, what the strong list is enterprising. Customer service people. Customer service, sure. Healthcare. Healthcare. Yeah, we'll put healthcare. First, first responders. Education. First responders, yep. Yeah. Okay, social now work. can somebody, social worker, yeah. 
can somebody come up with a career that would be both realistic and social? Teacher. On that. Because it is harder to come up with. And what I'll say to some of my clients who might be social and realistic is that um, you know, you can go into healthcare and then at home you can build furniture, like as a hobby kind of thing. Because sometimes it is hard to combine the two opposites into one career. Okay, um, the next pair that we're going to talk about, if I got it right this time. Do I have it there? Investigative? Investigative. Yeah, that one's good. <laughs> All right, investigative and enterprising. Okay, investigative people are called the thinkers. They prefer scientific research and intellectual pursuits. So we're representing that here with my son's microscope. All right, and that contrasts to enterprising people, the, the persuaders, we call them. Um, they like leadership, influencing, and persuasive pursuits. The, the gentleman I told you who ended up going into sales, who was considering law and other prestigious careers, he, um, he's a good example of an enterprising fellow. And that's why not only will he be there running a corporation one day, but he's going to be probably running his own corporation or a startup, com com combination startup with somebody. So that's the difference between um, investigative and enterprising. So do you guys want to shout out some... Okay, this time I'm going, to, I'm going to say different. Don't tell me a career that is investigative. I want you to list something your child does and enjoys doing that's investigative. Um, <laughs> social justice issues. Okay. They research it? They... Both. I'm... Uh, social justice issues... Um, can be sort of more social and, and enterprising, I would say. So I'm looking for something more like, um, I don't want to give it, give it away. Science. Sure, science, science. somebody. Science. science. Okay, but that's school. Can you name something that does outside of school? Oh, so lab research. Like, um, yeah. Lab research, like, yeah. like at home? Uh, like a food scientist, kind of like research. Okay, that would be a job, sure. Um, uh, uh, so I'm gonna write down scientist for a job. But I want you guys, how about the base and fair? The what fair? It's science, it's science fair, but okay. So I want you guys to think of something outside school, oh, or something far now. away from careers and education and stuff that your kid does that's investigative. Cool. I mean, reading about or looking at documentaries and reading. Sure. Um, so, so reading, um, like nonfiction. I'm going to put a reading or documentaries. Holy scores or something. This is something. Oh, police, police. Uh, police. Like security person, maybe. Yeah, that would be another career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The ones who try and blow things up or um, create fires or yes, you know, the ones pyromania. <laughs> Technic. No, you know the ones where you, you they take they take the vinegar and the and the yeah, baking yeah, yeah. soda they and they try and make a volcano. Yeah, or they um, or they see what happens when different things combine at home. Yeah. That's an excellent example. Does anybody have one of those kids at home who, who just like puts the weirdest combination together and then well, writes it down and tries to make you eat it? You I'm, I'm it. a girl, so they go into the kitchen and make stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Cooking can definitely yeah. be yeah. considered uh, investigative yes. depending how you do it. If, yeah. if you're if you're doing it like that. <laughs> yeah. What about the, uh, this, uh, in a school, in a high school, the, the first year the old days of the past kind of event to encourage kids go to work with the parents? Yes, the, the uh, take, take your kids to work day. Yeah, yeah, that's so an that excellent. Be, that's an excellent way to test possibilities for oh. sure um, in their journey. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna. I'm. I'm gonna tell you. I. I had two scientist boys. They're both in engineering, so they were kind of uh, realistic uh, and investigative. One is artistic, and one is conventional. Um, so, so my realistic investigative boys, they were into bugs and dinosaurs and that kind of research. They were huge time readers, so I knew they were academically inclined from when they were like this old just because of this, this academic pursuit that they would have. Uh, we would say to, to my son's teacher, like, oh, that's a really cool lesson you just taught on Roman history. And she's like, yeah, your son read, like, he knows more than me now. Like, like they were just that type of kids. Like, like you know, so that's an investigator. My, my one son asked for a book on how to uh, speak Latin. Uh, for Christmas one year, and I was buying the book, and I was embarrassed at the bookstore because she's going, "Wow, interesting kid!" And he never did pick it up and use it or whatever, but but he wanted to, right? So so uh, so that's the type of investigative type that I'm talking about. So when you guys go home today, 
I want you to look at that chart. And when your kid does something, I want you to see how it falls under these different things. So enterprising, name something outside of school and career um, that would be, because I already talked about you know, salesmen and stuff like that. Name something your kids do that are enterprising. The lemonade stand. Yes, there is the classic entrepreneur. Or if you're, um, oh, my brother was a perennial garage sale guy. Man, we had a one, like, garage sale. Stuff. Yeah. That would be the enterprising um, sort, the sort who's not willing, or not afraid to uh, put themselves out there and sell something. Yeah. Negotiating screen time. Yes. <laughs> we all have amazing negotiators nowadays. I think we're, we're driving our children into being the negotiators. Yeah. Creating a Pokemon card. Yes. Pokemon <laughs> Yes, if they are good at it, uh, my younger son not so much. Older brother won all the time, so older brother definitely uh, a little stronger on that enterprising thing. So do you guys see what I mean about how you can do what Mark Kielberger said and, and look at what your kids are interested in and then divide it into these different areas and say, you know, I just had a client uh, this week who um, the father didn't say, this girl isn't acting, drama. That's, she's been in musical theater for the past three years. And she's a, she's a decent, uh, strong student. Um, and all of a sudden, she's decided she wants to do chemistry. So her dad is thinking, ah, yeah, my extroverted, you know, persuasive uh, teacher, social type, like, like she scored very, very high on social, um, is now talking about chemistry. So I didn't even go there with her. I don't know if she's thinking lab, if she's thinking what. But you can see the mismatch that the parent picked up on and why he sent her to see me. Because he doesn't want to say to her, I don't think you should go into chemistry. Because she's being practical. She's mm -hmm. saying, I don't want to go into drama as a career because I want to be a mom one day and I want to have a stable job, nine to five, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, so these are the type of conflicts that, that come up where the dad knows based on the daughter's activities at home that something's not right here and, and let's explore this a little more. Um, okay, let's see the last two. I, I love this one. I, I couldn't find my adding machine and I couldn't bring in a spreadsheet. It doesn't really translate that well, a computer spreadsheet. Um, so for uh, conventional... old school. I went old school. <laughs> I, I went in my basement and I found, yeah. uh, I found this locking uh, accounting wow. ledger. Like, isn't that amazing? Oh, yeah. Like, this is very old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really should try and get the history. But that's very old. I know. <laughs> I thought there was some writing yeah, somewhere, but, but uh, so we're going to use the, the accounting ledger to talk about the uh, organizer. The organizer type personality prefers data management, numerical, and organizational pursuits. <laughs> And, uh, and so we've got the accounting ledger for an example because they like things in a row. They like Excel. Um, if, oh, okay, I'm going to jump ahead to an example and, and I don't want to. I want you guys to come up with an example. And then this is my husband's very first camera. Remember I said he was a graphic designer? So he was into photography in high school. Uh, he ruined that hobby a little bit because he does photography for some of his clients. Uh, so he gets paid for it. So it's not as much fun anymore. So um, the, the camera represents the creator who prefers creative, imaginative, and intuitive pursuits. So we'll put the camera out for the artistic. And, okay, hopefully you guys don't have any problem coming up with something. I've already said graphic designer for a career or architect for a career for an artist or musician we've got here. Come up with stuff that your kids do at home, their whole life maybe, that shows to me that they're an artist. And I'm not talking about the kid who once a year makes you a birthday card and, uh, and you're like, oh, it's beautiful. Uh, I'm talking about kids who, who are artists. Yeah. Redecorates the room on a regular basis. There you go. Okay. You've got a decorator at home, do you? Uh, I have one of those, yeah. yeah. Okay, anybody? Yeah. My daughter this summer picked up, like, she wanted to do the henna design. Yes. And this, just this past week, apparently, she was doing designs on all her friends' hands Wonderful. with markers. Oh, with mark <laughs> With permanent marker? I don't know. I don't know. Like, oh, okay. that's good. That's good. She's like, I'm so good at it. Cake decorating. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How many kids uh, here are a fan of that Cake Boss show? Mm -hmm. uh, lots of... Uh... Okay. okay. Anybody else? Makeup? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm going to put hair and makeup. Yeah. Oh, plays. Yes. Who has kids who, who used to put on plays for them? Puppet plays or that type of thing. Yeah. 
Okay. And finally, conventional. The ones that count, they're like a Counters. <laughs> you know, like, no, but organ, like it's sorters. It's sorters. It's the. Yeah. Yes, I have one of those. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, yeah. Using every color known to mankind for post it notes. Oh, they have a system. Yes. Oh, yeah. The binders before. Post it mm -hmm. systems. <laughs> okay. Systems being the, the operative systems. word there. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to share their kids' obsessive compulsive? <laughs> checklist people. Yeah, yeah. checklist people. I, I, I love that because <laughs> they watch BNN, the Business News Network. Oh, sports okay. Channel. Okay, so they're they're global. So yeah. All right. Yes. Uh, I was trying to understand the conventional because uh, see here it's like more like a traditional kind of like a data management or open organizational uh, pursuits and uh, but I think um, you know uh, these days it's quite different from like a you know like a older traditional way because like if we talk about de uh, data management it's more like statistics it's more like Com digital computers, yeah, computers, computers. math yeah. kind of mathematic kind of like a you yeah. know, brain you know I still just want to try to understand how to yeah. relate like older you know like a traditional right of this to thing. the modern yeah. mm -hmm. um, I, I think they do integrate so um, rarely does somebody off, often they do but rarely Clearly, does somebody come up as just one letter is super high and all five letters is super super low? Um, I'll tell you how this this strong interest inventory was used as a tool in uh, the United States. Um, did they say what time the next workshop is starting? Yeah. Yeah. Everything's been going back, back. but it's starting at 11:30 or it's 15 no, no. minutes later. Okay. 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 Um, so. In the United States, uh, there was a case study where they went into a, a underprivileged high school. Now, this would be a school in a very poor area where all of the parents would be probably blue-collar workers. And so, where blue-collar jobs generally fall under, whether you, you know that would be your first choice for a job or not. Does somebody want to tell me where a blue-collar job would generally fall? Under realistic. Right. Exactly. So. They went into the school where the, the children's um, main experience through careers uh, of their parents would have been blue collar type careers. And they spent a whole month, they had buy-in by the whole school. They spent a whole month on each of these six different areas so that the kids' worlds opened up. Uh, some of the kids who thought that they were gonna be a factory worker uh, discovered that they had a particular artistic talent and that maybe they should consider studying music or that type of thing. So it can be very powerful uh, to open kids' eyes wide, but we're more like the second school that they did a case study in in the United States. They went into a prep school, and at this prep school, the kids are kind of like our kids who, who've grown up fairly well. Um, most of our kids are, are fairly privileged and our school system is, is quite uh, great here in, in Canada. So uh, our kids have generally been exposed to all six of these areas through their schooling, through their education, um, uh, through their parents, through their education at home, uh, uncles, aunts, that sort of thing. So, so our kids are quite privileged. So a lot of the kids that come to me, so at this particular school, what they did instead was they spent they spent one week on each area, not a, not a whole month, they spent a week on each area to try and get these kids who said, oh, I'm interested in all six areas, to try and get them to narrow down to, in fact, what type of environment suited them better. And, uh, and it was quite effective. So I find that's more my job because I have a lot of kids come to me who score moderately interested or above in all these different areas. And so they, um, uh, you know, really could work in any one of these areas. So it's a matter of making sure that they learn to discern and say which areas are actually, you know. So, so this one girl uh, this week scored very high in social. She scored high in another one and moderate in the rest. So we do know that social um, is her, this is the one who wants to go into chemistry. So, so uh, she's all about people and, and um, uh, she, she like um, supports her friends and helps her friends out and things and stuff like that. And, and, and you know, her dad sent her to me because she's looking at chemistry. And, and not to say I can't, I actually have an idea for chemistry. Guelph has a very good nutrition um, program uh, which would combine that people helping healthcare thing with chemistry. So it's not you can't do it. But um, 
So when you guys uh, are looking at your kids, it's, it's also hard not to put your own bias on your kids. So, you know, with my kids, uh, I've been self-employed for over 20 years, and um, I, I expect my kids, they're, they're going into engineering, startups, they're like throwing money at tech startups nowadays. And so I want my kids to go into a startup. Well, my older son says, no way am I doing a startup. Most of them fail and most of them lose money and I'm not going to waste somebody's money or my money or my time or whatever on a failed startup. And uh, so, so this is how our bias can, we can try and influence our kids. And uh, so it's best to try and keep an open mind. Um, you know, you can't, by the time your kid gets to be a teenager, you can't really tell them what to do, but you can kind of just like subtly influence them. Um, maybe even by... Just to let everybody know, this is a 10 minute warning. There's 10 minutes remaining in session A. Their, their clock is obviously different than mine. I've got about eight minutes. I um, want to just stop you for one second. Yes. Um, my job is to thank you on behalf of the pit committee, but my other job is to make sure that the kids get their pizza at 11.30. So before I zip out, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Parent Involvement Committee and the Health District School Board for all of this great information. You take your time and finish up, and I'm going to go make sure that your kids get their pizza. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to open the floor up to, to questions in a second, um, but I just want to sort of wrap up. Um, I said I'd give you some silly tips on, uh, on how to help your kids make choices. So number one, the first thing you can do is uh, try to make sure they're not overwhelmed. As adults with hopefully full executive functioning uh, faculties, um, we tend to look at the kids going off to college or university or the workplace we tend to look at it completely differently than, than our kids do. We can see all the choices and we can somewhat evaluate the choices by, you know, what's a hot area, what's up and coming, what's new. Um, but for some kids, they are not there yet and they won't um, look at it that way. So, so number one, you can try not to overwhelm your kid with choices because just like Barbara Collar also said, you know, it's a lot easier to make the choices simple. Um, so if they're, and, and I find um, we're, we're doing kids a, a bit of a disservice um, sometimes nowadays by telling them, you know, there's 5,000 programs at college um, and things like that. And also with the, the different pathways, like it was so much simpler when we were in high school. And, uh, you know, we just thought, okay, when we, when we leave, uh, high school, we're either going to get our grade 12 and we're going to go to college or get our grade 13 and go to university or we're going to go work, you know? And, uh, and it, it seemed like there were three choices, like it really did, it really seemed simple back then. And so one of the things that is a bit overwhelming for kids, and uh, I warn one of my kids about this, you know, at school they're going to try and tell you that you could go to college to become an electrical technician or something engineering, or you could go to this, or you could do that, or you could go to the workplace. And, uh, and I told them, you know, you're academically inclined, sorry, like, it's just the way you are, so you're going to university and it's just that simple. And, uh, and, and I made it very simple that way for my kids. And that's not to say that I wouldn't have been open-minded if they wanted to take that gap year and stuff, but I kind of just sort of ran on a few assumptions to make it easy and less stressful uh, for them. And, um, and so, so here's the, the, the funny tip, like, don't be surprised if your kids have some odd decision-making processes that don't fit your way of evaluating a situation. I had a son who wanted to apply to Queens because they have good food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, or or kids who went to the university because of the, the residents. Yes. Yes. One of those. Right. So, so, you know, there's odd things going on in the kids' brains that um, are not necessarily valid to us as reasons. And so one of the silly tips I was going to give you is um, uh, I have a friend um, and, and she would tell me, if you have a big decision to make, write one on one piece of paper and the other on the other piece of paper and then just like mix them up, stand them on the floor and like stand on them and, and then right foot or left foot. Like which one am I going to pick? And it's kind of an arbitrary way of doing things and it actually works quite effectively for, for two reasons. Um, you know, if you're trying to make a mini, 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 mo kind of choice, uh, when you do just pick it out of a hat, 
you have the freedom of choice of going with the other one, right? So, so you can't go wrong unless you're super stubborn when you're going to stick to that. Whatever comes out, I'm 100% going to stick. That's what my eldest child is like. 100% I'm going to stick with that. So, so you know, kind of like doing this eeny, meeny, miny, mo thing isn't a bad way. Um, kids tend to pick universities based on where their friends are going. They pick university programs based on their best subject in school, which isn't always the right thing to do. That's that chemistry girl. Right now it's her strongest course at school. That was me in fashion design. Home economics was my, my strongest course. Um, they'll pick universities uh, based on it being far away from home. I'm going to Dow, you know, I'm going to McGill. Um, yeah. They'll, they'll pick uh, universities uh, based on the feeling when they're on the campus, you know? And these are all legitimate reasons for your sons and daughters. And um, so as parents, you have to kind of be behind the scenes trying to make sure that, you know, they're making choices that you can get behind. Um, but at the same time, some parents actually just are, are totally laissez-faire and they're like, yeah, whatever you do, you can make your own mistakes. Um, but some parents can't afford to do that, right? We think about the money we're spending at university. And um, uh, one of the Bateman math teachers, her, her son said he wanted to go into physics from grade nine. And she's like, really? Because her kid's this realistic type, type kid. And so sure enough, she's like, okay, if you're convinced that's what you want. So she did not have him you know, explore options, test possibilities. And she just said, okay, that's your gut, we'll go with your gut. She said it was the, like $20,000 mistake. Because sure enough, he was sitting in theoretical physics classes of, you know, 300 students, and total misfit for him. And uh, so, you know, so as parents, there's this balance. You want your kids to make some mistakes, because they learn from making those mistakes and from the lessons that they uh, can take from what they have to do to, to make things work. Um, but at the same time, you also want to be kind of behind the scenes, subtly guiding them. And, and like I said, that's why some people end up sending their kids to me, because their kids like saying chemistry. Okay, and so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, you guys are free to leave, because we've got about two minutes. But if you, anybody wants to stay and ask a question as a group, that's fine with as well. Any questions, generally? Yeah, yes. I'm just following on uh, what the leader was saying. We're not sure about the university. Yeah. But there's also another aspect of that. Is there's a lot of commercialism in the universities about yes. uh, what the emphasis is more on the glory and glamour yes. rather than the, the reality yeah. is a little bit subtle in the presentation. Yeah. If I had time, I would have had you guys come and look at your kids' hobbies and see if they make good careers or bad careers or good hobbies or bad hobbies, or, you know, good for pay or bad for pay, because that's one of the, the important lessons to learn. And the other thing is, is um, I find uh, we live in a society where even charity work, like downstairs, it's become rock star stuff, right? So um, my eldest son just got back from Silicon Valley, and he wants to become an American. And he's following the presidential debate in the US. And he's not for Clinton or Trump. He's for another candidate. But, but, uh, but there's this rock star thing going on in the world where everything, everybody has to be a rock star. And, and uh, I swear I'm going to write a book one day that says how to raise, raise citizens, not superstars. Uh -huh. <laughs> because honestly, like, I, I was going to start off my talk today, I forgot, but I was going to say, you know, if everybody, everybody can't be a superstar, it's impossible. It's kind of like a pyramid scheme, right? Uh -huh. And um, so everybody can't be a rock star. So if you can raise your kids to do the best in their small little piece of the world, then that's great. So, you know, universities try to glamorize uh, a lot of things because there's so many programs and they're all competing with each other. And, uh, and they want your dollars, right? And colleges, oh my god, colleges are getting sexy. Like, colleges <laughs> are rocking oh, now. Like, for the combining with universities. Oh, 